For the past uh, several weeks, actually into last month or so, I'd been um, giving some presentations leading up to the Ten Commandments. And my, the last sermon I gave was on the First Commandment. So today we're going to begin looking at the Second Commandment. As I did point out last time I spoke, that Christ and God's law in one's life is a wonderful blessing. They go together in, in many ways. And God's law could be stated much like Christ st stated the Beatitudes. Blessed are you when you have the true God as your God, and blessed are you when you do not worship God through idols and so forth. As we look at the commandments, there's ten of them. They're stated rather simply. And we might conclude that, well, they're, they're rather simple, maybe somewhat limited, but that's not true. The Ten Commandments cover every sin that there is. The Ten Commandments define righteousness, and they define unrighteousness. We're told that in Ecclesiastes 12, 13. Let us hear the conclusion of the whole matter. Fear God and keep his commandments, for this is the whole duty of man. So what we find here is that the commandments reveal to us, according to Ecclesiastes, the whole duty of man. And as I've mentioned before, the new 40-day book coming out this year from Pacific Press, the Lord convicted me to make that one on the Ten Commandments. And I did find it a very enlightening study to dig deeper into the commandments, and it is amazing all that are in each of those commandments, more than we might recognize with a surface reading. When we look at the first commandment and the second commandment, they are very closely related. In the first commandment, God declares that he is to be the only God in the lives of his people, the one and only. In the second commandment, God reveals to us how not to worship him. That was read for our scripture today in Exodus 20, beginning with verse 4. You shall not make unto thee any graven image, or any likeness of anything that is in heaven above, or that is in the earth beneath, or that is in the water under the earth. You shall not bow down yourself to them, nor serve them, for I the Lord, your God, am a jealous God, visiting the iniquity of the fathers upon the children unto the third and fourth generation of them that hate me, and showing mercy unto thousands of them that love me and keep my commandments. You see, worshiping God through idols, images, demeans God in the mind of the worshiper. It brings our concept of God down to the earthly. And in fact, you may recall, last time I spoke, Romans 1, God points out that man worshiping idols was the first step in moving away from the true God. It came in quite early, of course, in human history. And in both the Old Testament and New Testament, pagan worship worship idols. I found it interesting, you know, here in this Western world, we don't see much of what we'd actually consider an idol. I'll get into that in a minute. But when I did go to India some years ago, I stayed in a um, quality inn motel in this city, I can't remember the name of the city, uh, where our union office was for that part of India, and I was speaking uh, in that area. And in the motel I stayed in, there was this god idol right in the lobby and it looked kind of like an elephant and uh, I looked it up on the internet I guess it's called Ganesha or Ganesha and I found it interesting that they would every morning put a plate of food in front of that idol and that's the first time I've ever seen anything like that and it, it you know I thought okay it, <laughs> the Bible talks about that and we know there are those things around the world now Many may rationalize in Christianity, for instance, that having some type of 
idol or image um, makes God more real. I've heard that argument. Um, maybe it makes the worshiper more reverent if they have something that, like that in front of them. But the opposite actually takes place. Instead of uplifting man's mind and heart to God with an idol, it actually, like I say, demeans who God is. He cannot be represented by any creature, any statue. And if we look at him in that manner, it's going to demean him and lower our concept of worship of God. We see that in the Christian church. Now I'm going to share a couple of things that I've observed in the Roman Catholic Church. Now there are some very sincere Christians who are Roman Catholics. Um, God looks at the heart when we worship. And my wife was raised Roman Catholic. Um, her family's Roman Catholic, so we have some relatives that are Roman Catholic, and I respect them very much. She actually has a cousin who's a Jesuit priest. I've met him, nice fellow. So what I'm gonna share next is nothing against the Roman Catholic people some very sincere folks. But what I am going to share is some things that may not be really according to God's word, just to make the point that even in Christianity, there can be idols and images to bow down to. For instance, the statue of Christ on the cross and the altar. I understand any time you walk before that, you're to bow down. Now, it's, of course, it's reverence, the idea there. But you find it interesting if you read the catechism, command number two is omitted. And of course, there's a reason for that because of what the command forbids. Also, something that I found fascinating through the years are these Mary apparitions. You might have heard of some of those. Um, a very famous one in 1917, uh, Our Lady of Fatima, Fatima, I guess that's how you pronounce it. There's uh, three children that supposedly saw Mary. And um, they kind of make a big deal of that. And then there's other cases where some image appears, some, some being that's supposedly Mary. And people will flock to it, to bow down to it. Well, if folks only knew one scripture, just one, they'd be protected from that. You might remember in, John, in Revelation, an angel appeared before John. Now, if a bright, brilliant, holy angel appeared before you or me, we might have a tendency to want to kneel down before them. Kind of human nature. Well, notice here, in Revelation chapter 19, verse 10, John says, I fell down at his feet to worship him. Kind of a natural response. Here's this beautiful being. Bow down to his feet. Fell down at his feet to worship him. And he said to me, see, you do it not. Don't do it. Get up, John. Don't do it. Why? He said here, I am your fellow servant. I'm simply one of you, a servant of God. I am your fellow servant and of your brethren that have the testimony of Jesus Worship God. You see, that goes right along with this commandment we're looking at today, the second commandment. We are only to bow down and worship God, not in the form of an angel. And what does this tell us? If some beautiful being appears before us and they allow us to bow down to them and they accept that worship, what are they? An evil spirit an unholy angel. Because an angel of God will abide by the second commandment, of course. It would not allow you or me, even though we meant well, would not allow you or me to bow down to them. You see, that's why the scriptures, the psalm calls them, God's word is our shield. It's our protector. We need to know the word of God because I tell you, the deceptions of Satan, Jesus said, before he comes, he says, there should be great signs and wonders that if it were possible, it would deceive the very elect. The signs and wonders and miracles are going to be so intense and so good. <laughs> They're going to appear so real that if we don't know the word of God, we're going to be sucked into it. So that's why we must know the word of God 
And I always encourage us to be filled with the Spirit because it's the Spirit that enlightens us on the Word of God. So that one scripture, <laughs> that one scripture would protect people from being deceived by that. Now, this commandment does not forbid statuary or pictures. Uh, the, what it forbids is bowing down to them. If you look at the Old Testament sanctuary, yeah, there were statues of angels there. There were, there were pictures, if you will, images there. That in itself is not wrong, but it's using them in worship in the sense of bowing down to them. True worship and true prayer is always in the spirit. Jesus said that. He said that in John 2, 24. He said, God is a spirit, and they that worship him worship him in spirit and in truth. And some time ago, I gave a series on the armor of God, and Paul ends the list of the armor with God saying, pray always in the spirit. True worship and true prayer is always in the the spirit and that's again why Paul commands us in Ephesians be filled with the spirit and that's why I encourage all of us myself included from the moment you wake up in the morning Lord fill me with your Holy Spirit because Paul talks about walking in the spirit I want to walk in the spirit live in the spirit I want to have the mind of Jesus the thoughts of, of Christ when we come to worship, I want to worship God in the Spirit, through the Spirit. You see, the Spirit worshiping through me, leading me in worship, prayer. I've shared with you about praying in the Spirit. The Holy Spirit will prompt us and indicate to us what to pray, what to pray for. Now, knowing this command, it's impossible to worship and pray in the Spirit if we're worshiping through an idol. They don't go together. Can't do it. And that's why the Lord again commands us not to do that. Also, as we look at this command, it implies we must very carefully consider every aspect of our worship of God. Ecclesiastes 5, 1 and 2. Walk prudently when you go to the house of God, draw near to hear rather than to give the sacrifice of fools, for they do not know what they, that they do evil. Do not be rash with your mouth, and let not your heart utter anything hastily before God. For God's in heaven, you're on earth. Therefore, let your words be few. The point being, we do not want to approach God in worship frivolously with our mind all over the place. When we come to worship God, we want to have our focus on God. And this text has great significance for us, seventh, those of us that are Seventh-day Adventists, and when it comes to the Sabbath worship. Isaiah 58, you know that text, 13. If you turn away your foot from the Sabbath, from doing your pleasure on my holy day, and call the Sabbath the light, the holy day of the Lord honorable, and honor him, not doing your own ways, nor finding your own pleasure, nor speaking your own words. Then you should delight yourself in the Lord. Now, when it says here, turn your foot away from the Sabbath, at a certain period in the Old Testament, if you bought a piece of property, you would go there and you'd put your foot on it. That's mine. Well, <laughs> who owns the Sabbath? God does. He's the one that created it. And when he says, turn off of it, he's saying, quit treating it like it's yours. <laughs> it's not yours. It's God's. And God has given us instruction how to keep it. And we'll look at that one of these times. And that's, that's why he uses that imagery here. But then he, he tells us some things about it. When he says don't do your own pleasure, it doesn't mean you don't enjoy the Sabbath. It means, again, there are certain things we will choose not to do on the Sabbath that we might do other days. It's to become a delightful day. But he also says here about guarding our words, which is what I'm pointing out here. Guarding our words, which means we're going to be guarding our thoughts. You see... Worshiping in spirit 
is being filled with the Spirit and the Spirit inspiring us and leading us in our worship. So we'll be leading our thoughts, our words, our entire worship. Our focus is to be on, on God because he's the one worshiping. It's not like if I'm selling my car, I wouldn't, I wouldn't go up to Ike and say, well, you know, if it weren't Sabbath, Ike, I'd tell you I'm selling my car, but I won't tell you about that or talk about that today. No. Uh, we want to guard our words. We wanna, the key is keep our focus on God when we come to worship God. Don't let things distract us, and we want to be sure we're not a distraction to somebody else as well. That's also implied there. Also, this counsel of the Old Testament applies to prayers. Again, pray in the Spirit, okay, in worship. Notice what Christ said about prayer. But when you pray, use not vain repetitions as the heathen do, for they think that they shall be heard for their much speaking. Well, there are some practices in some Christian church where there are vain repetitions and I think you may know what I'm talking about that's not biblical and even be careful of that in our private prayer life we can all fall in the trap that our personal prayer life becomes kind of just routine same thing all the time all the time now there's going to be certain things we're going to pray for all the time but when we pray Lord fill me with your spirit I want to pray in the spirit here uh, even our private prayer life is worship of God. And we ask the Lord, pray through me, Lord. What do you, what do you want to guide me in today? And he'll bring, he'll bring things to our mind. Also, public prayers should not be long. Now, I know one of the hardest things to do is to pray up front. I, I still sometimes get a little nervous if I'm supposed to do that. Um, it's understandable. Some people have the gift of prayer more than others. We're all to pray but some have the gift of prayer, and it seems to come more easily to them. But our private prayers can be as long as we want. But when it comes to public prayer, I find this interesting counsel from Ellen White, um, uh, manuscript 808. Make short prayers in meetings. Lengthy prayers when you talk and commune with God in the closet. So that's a good thing to remember if you're asked to pray up front. And I tell folks, sometimes I'll give a little guideline of what to pray on, because it helps me. Because I don't know how you are when you get under stress. Sometimes you can forget someone's name. When I was young, uh, and I'd go to a door to, you know, to visit somebody I didn't know, and I had somebody with me, I'd, I'd knock on the door. First, I'd hope they weren't home, because I was very shy. And then when they were home, they'd come to the door, and I'd smile, and I'd say, Hi, I'm, uh, I'm, I'm Dennis Smith. This is, um, and I forget their name, who's next to me. So I know about stress, <laughs> and it can be stressful, especially when we're praying up front. So I, I tell folks sometimes, it doesn't hurt to write out your prayer. Ask God to lead you in what you're going to pray, if you're going to pray up front. Or you can have a little outline, A-C-T-I, <laughs> A, adoration. Lord, praise your name for who you are. Adoration. C, confession. Lord, forgive us our sins this day. You know, you're praying for the congregation yourself. A-C-T, thanksgiving. Thank you, Lord, for all your blessings. And I, intercession. What are we asking God for today? If you have that little simple thing in your mind, A-C-T-I, make, makes it fairly simple. It keeps the prayer to the point, and we don't wander around. So, again, there's some little things we can do to, I think, help better fit into this command when it comes to worshiping God and, and, and how to worship Him in the different ways. Another thing about this, this command, it forbids ostentatious and ritualistic worship. It's to be real, not so formal. Uh, elaborate ceremonies and elaborate attire You know, in some ways, the more simple it is, the better it is. Because the focus is on God, not the person. If I was dressed up here and all kinds, you know, we, we need to dress appropriately, yes, for your culture, yes. But if I was dressed here with something very elaborate, and, you know, where's the attention going? Wow, look at our pastor today, what he's wearing, you know. 
No, I don't want you to remember me. <laughs> I want you to remember the Lord and, and perhaps, God willing, what was <laughs> he said through me today. So, we, you know, that, that's a part of this as well. It takes the attention off God. And Colossians, Paul wrote Colossians 2, These things indeed have an appearance of wisdom in self-imposed religion, false humility and neglect of the body, but of no value against the indulgence of the flesh. Also, there are um, as many false gods today as there were in ancient times. They may not be statues, but they're still false gods. Anything we put between our allegiance to God and us is a false god, is an idol. It may not be a statue, but it would still be breaking this command. And, you know, Paul says about our natural condition, the carnal mind is enmity against God. It is not subject to the law of God, neither indeed can be. It's in Romans. Our natural mind, natural sinful mind and thoughts want to break this command. It comes natural to us to want to break this second commandment. Carnal, sinful mind loves the things of the world. We're all that way. And John gave an interesting warning here, a very, a very serious warning. 1 John 2, 15 and 16. Love not the world. Now he's going to tell us some ways we can know whether we're loving the world or not. Neither the things that are in the world. Hmm. If any man love the world, the love of the Father is not in him. Now that, that's pretty strong, isn't it? If I love the world and the things of the world, then the love of the Father is not in me. I, I can either love one or the other, it seems. I can't have both. For all that is in the world, now he's going to list them. Lust of the flesh, lust of the eyes, and the pride of life. Well, let's think about those, those three things. Lust of the flesh. When you look at the meaning of that, that expression, it's talking about the natural, sinful desires from within us. We all have those. Wrong desires within us, as contrasted with something coming through the eyes. You see something through the eyes, and it'll stimulate something that shouldn't be there. But lust of the flesh, this is, these, these are sinful desires that's just within us, and we're all born with them because of our sinful nature. They'd include such things as, that's within us, perverted appetite. We've had some things on health. I think we're all working on that one. Um, sinful sexual desires. Greed for wealth. I remember I was in one church one time. One of our, um, one of the men of the church came. I'd been sharing things on the Holy Spirit and the changes God wants to bring in. And I never had someone come to me with this request. But he came to me and said, Pastor, I need you to pray for me to get rid of greed. Well, that's a valid prayer. So we had, we had prayer together. Because that's, again, the lust of the flesh. Greed, wanting more, more money, more things. That's the lust of of the flesh. Philippians 3. For many walk of whom I have told you often and now tell you even weeping that they are the enemies of the cross of Christ whose end is destruction whose God is their belly and whose glory is in their shame who mind earthly things. Now don't get discouraged if we see ourselves not quite where we want to be. Number one we ask God to fill us with the Spirit. Then number two, the Spirit will start opening our eyes to things that need changing. Now when he opens our eyes to things that need changing, don't get discouraged. Figure, okay, thank you, Lord, for showing me. Then I'll tell you this, anything God asks you to do, he will do it in you. That's where you're not on your own on this thing at all. So as I go through these things, if you see anything applying to you, don't get discouraged. Become aware of it. I know as I go through this, preparing this sermon, yeah, there's some stuff. <laughs> I'm still growing in this. Then you got the lust of the eyes. This is anything that would enter our mind through our eyes that is not within the will of God. Boy, today is there a lot of that. 
television, signs, radio, any, anywhere you go in our culture, you're going to have visual stimuli trying to take you down the wrong path. It's, it's there. And, and so we've got to guard that as Christians. Guard it. Remember, Jesus gave the warning, Matthew 5, 27. You've heard it, that it was said by them of old, you should not commit adultery. Now remember, when Jesus came to this world, as I've mentioned before, God's commandments are a transcript of his character. They are a revelation of what God is like. However, they were on tables of stone. And that, that's good, but we needed a revelation in the flesh of what they are. And so when Jesus came to this world, he says he came to magnify the law. What Jesus came, he came to live out in the flesh the Ten Commandments in his life by his words. So the counsel he gives, the warning he gives, the instruction, everything, he's actually manifesting before us the Ten Commandments lived out in the life, which is the kind of life he wants us to live. And so that's what Jesus is doing here. He said, you've heard it said of all, you should not commit adultery. Now, back in Christ's day, they just had the letter of the law, and it says, thou shalt not commit adultery. Oh, well, good. I've never committed adultery. Click that one off. Well, it wasn't quite that way. Jesus knew that. But I say to you that whosoever looks on a woman to lust after her has committed adultery with her already in his heart. Oh, that takes the law and digs a little deeper. That's the lust of the eyes. Whatever we allow, and God will warn you, that's why being spirit-filled is important, as you go through your day, whether you're reading a magazine, whether you're watching TV, wherever you're at, there will be images to come before your eyes. The Holy Spirit will give you a warning. Real red flag. Careful here. And you just simply turn the page or turn your eyes away from it. There's, we don't lose our free will in it. Or if you're having a hard time, you ask Jesus, give me your desire on this, so I don't want to do it. And he'll do that, you see. He'll give you his desires. So we must guard, be on guard. And I will say this. The more we grow in the Lord, more of the things we once liked, we don't like so much anymore. So there is, and you, you see that in your life. You see progress. You look back in your life and you can see things. Yeah, you know, I used to maybe have more of a challenge with some of these things, but praise God, I, I've kind of gotten over some of that. But then there's other things. <laughs> That's why it's a continued growth. As long as we live, it's a continued growth that God keeps showing us. I tell you, I thank the Lord he doesn't show us everything at once. Because if he did it, whoa, <laughs> forget it. I can't do anything about that. No, he, he's gentle, he's careful. But I will say this, he, remember he talks about walk in the light? See, all of this I'm talking about, the truth is light. Light. Now, we've all had the experience. You're, you're in the dark, and then the lights go on. What's your reaction? Ooh, that's a little bright. Got to adjust to it. There, there's an imagery here that, uh, an illustration I think has truth. If you don't walk in the light he's given you, there's no way you can walk into brighter light because you haven't adjusted to that light. See that imagery there? You got to adjust to the light he's given you, and he won't give you more than you can deal with. He's promised that. But what he gives you, get adjusted to it. Walk in it. And then as you do that, there will be a brighter light yet. That's the progress. That's how it works. And, and so we need to be aware of these things, guard these things. And then when he says the pride of life, that's the third thing. Pride of life refers especially to materialism. Boy, we live in a material age today. Materialism. I think I've seen a bumper sticker once or twice. He who has the most toys wins or something like that. Have you ever seen that? Yeah, that's kind of the attitude today. Uh, well, let's talk about materialism. Now, material things are not bad in themselves. 
I'm tempted to say, maybe I will. It's like musical instruments, you know. They can be abused or they can be used for God's glory, so, you know. There's a whole history of that. So here, uh, tangent. There's nothing wrong with material things. Poverty is not holiness. Some people think that. Poverty is not holiness. Somebody who is wealthy and is a committed Christian can be a great blessing to others. That's why God gives us wealth, by the way, <laughs> not to have a big bank account. Now, we should plan for the future, but he gives us more than we need so we have something to share with others. That's why he gives us more than we need. That, that's the goal. I remember visiting one family many years ago. They weren't a wealthy family, and they had just bought a new mobile home, nice mobile home. Three times during that visit, they apologized for having that new mobile home. I felt sorry for them. You should, if God made it possible for you to have a new mobile home or a new car, and you're not cutting him out in any way, there's nothing wrong with material things at all. So, you know, we want to keep it in balance. But what is it talking about? Well, if we take pride in our material possessions, okay, we're starting to head toward a, uh, a problem. If our primary goal in life is material possessions, now they're becoming an idol. Let's say... I choose to work on the Sabbath because I'm wanting to buy this new car and I got to have a little more down payment. Okay, that car, money had just become an idol to me because I'm disregarding God's law. I'm putting that first. Or, well, I, better, I, I really can't see how I can afford to pay tithe and offering for a few months because I've got to do this and this and this with my money. Okay, what am I doing? I'm putting whatever this, this, and this is these material things above God. That's when it becomes an idol. You see, that's, that's the difference when it becomes an idol. Other areas, pride of life, personal achievement. Now, there's nothing wrong with, with in using the right word, uh, pride, pride of, of achievement. Nothing wrong with that. I mean, I... I I, I thank the leaders of our youth that put on this program today. And I think they have, using the word in the right way, <laughs> they can be proud of what they did to, for those kids. It was a blessing to them and a blessing to us. Yeah. But pride in achievements is when, when we may be jealous of others who are achieving more than we are in that area. I, I heard a... a Actually, the pastor who baptized me, his daughter had written this in a flyleaf of a book. The test of true Christianity is when you can thank God for someone else's success where you have failed. I thought about that. Yeah. Because our human nature is, well, I wanted to achieve there, and how come there, you know, all that stuff. So there can be the wrong kind of pride and achievement. Or... We choose to work on the Sabbath to achieve our personal career goals because we're afraid we'll lose the job if we don't. I told you this story about working at Boeing right out of college. A serious challenge we were facing in tool design. We don't want 707s back then to fall out of the air. But you got to put God first in whatever situation we're in. If we don't, whatever that is becomes an idol to us. Also, physical appearance can become an idol. Excessive time and money used in personal goals like these. Paul talks about this a bit. 1 Timothy 2, 9 and 10. In like manner, manner also that women adorn themselves in modest apparel with propriety and moderation. Not with braided hair. By the way, braided hair, what the women would do back then, they would braid gold in their hair. So then when they walked out in the sun, look at me, see. Let me ask you this. When we dress, who do we want to draw attention to, ourselves or the Lord? The Lord. 
If we're dressing in a way, well, let's take back to, to Jesus. If you were to look at Jesus in a lineup of men, you could not tell a difference between him or anyone else. He was a common man among the common people. Now, we should dress neatly for our culture, appropriately, yes, all that's good. But we want to ask ourselves when, when we spend money and time on adornment, what's my real motive here? And, and again, God can show us. By the way, do not judge someone else on this. <laughs> we are not clothes police. We are not adornment police. Judge ourselves. Pray to God, Lord, what, what do you want with me? That's where we want it to be. And, um, and God will show each one of us. So that's what he says here. Um, with moderation... And by the way, when he says modest apparel, does that ever apply today? Um, we live in a very modest, gener immodest generation. Okay, modesty, propriety, moderation, not with that braided hair with the gold in it. Or gold, or pearls, or costly array. But which is proper for women professing godliness with good works. So again... It's for each of us to make the decision ourselves. Also, oh, there's so much, you know, so much self-focus, the me generation, Facebook. People get upset if they don't uh, have enough likes, those that send to Facebook. <laughs> uh, I've seen people show a toe that was healing on Facebook, as though everybody in the world wants to know about your toe. That's kind of the epitome of me, me, me. Uh, so many things. Now, God, you know, he, he ends this commandment with the words, For the Lord your God is a jealous God, is the iniquity of the fathers upon the children to the third and fourth generation that hate me, showing mercy to thousands of them that love me and keep my commandments. What does it mean he's a jealous God? God, he jealously guards his position with his people because he knows if we turn to any other God, we're going to get hurt. He's jealous for his position and his relationship with us. He wants us and him to be the one and only in that sense. Also, God would not accept half-hearted or formal meaningless worship. Again, as I said before, we want to prepare our hearts when we come to worship. Jesus talked about that. God also pronounced judgment. I've always found this an interesting part of this command. He pronounced judgment... On those who provoke him with idols. And he talks about the consequence of the iniquities of the fathers being passed on unto the descendants, to the third or fourth generation. I thought that's interesting that he says that here. But he says of them that hate him. Now, this is not arbitrary when you read those words. It's not arbitrary. No, it's on those that hate him. And by the way, a child growing up alone, sometimes you wonder, what's the benefit of a Christian home? You're giving that child a Christian foundation. And you're praying for that child. And it gives God a rite of passage in that child's life. So the opposite works true, too. As you are faithful to God and you seek to lead your children faithfully, that can pass down to the second and third and fourth generation as well. So can the opposite. But God holds us each accountable. Ezekiel, the soul of that sinneth, it shall die. The son shall not bear the iniquity of the father. Neither shall the father bear the iniquity of the son. The righteousness of the righteous shall be upon him. The wickedness of the wicked shall be upon them. So this can be broken. If, you know, if, if we grow in a home or if we grow up in a home where God was not worshipped, it's not an absolute truth that we are going to not worship the true God. We all are independent, and as God's Spirit convicts us, we have the choice whether to accept Him or not. Also, if we look at anything other than God for deliverance, whatever it is, it's an idol. There's so many things here. And when you think about these negative hereditary consequences, there's negative hereditary, you know, all the diseases we got in the world today, why is that? Well, because somebody in your past, great, 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 great grandparents, 
broke God's health laws. We reap some of the consequences. Genetics, they're learning a lot about that today. Fascinating. I thank God the day's coming when all those genetic consequences will be wiped away. <laughs> I'm looking for that new body. And, that, and that's how this command ends. I, I, I like it that God ends it this way. And showing mercy unto thousands of them that love me and keep my commandments. We serve a merciful God. And in everything I've shared today, if you find yourself falling short, praise God, he's opening our eyes. Then ask the Spirit to lead us so that we'll grow in the ways that he wants us to grow. He's a merciful God. Merciful. That's his chief characteristic when he revealed himself to Moses. I love it in Micah where God says, I delight in mercy. He loves to forgive you. <laughs> you know, God has emotion and feelings. The Bible's clear on that. It actually gives God pleasure to forgive you. It does. It gi- that's what he says. I delight in mercy. It gives him pleasure. And in Psalm 23, 6, David said, Surely goodness and mercy shall follow me all the days of my life. As I've shared with you before, that word follow is pursue. God is chasing after you with his goodness and with his mercy. And the moment you fall in sin, he's right there. Here, please, take my forgiveness. I want to forgive you. Why is that so important to him? He wants you back with him. And he knows it's sin that separates So through Jesus Christ, we can be delivered spiritually from sin, emotionally, from the wounds of the heart caused by sin. All of us have some of that. And physically delivered from sickness and disease. And of course, the full restoration will take place when Jesus comes back. God wants you with him. When you read about the second coming of Christ, the Lord himself shall descend from heaven with a shout, the voice of the archangel, dead in Christ, rise first. We which are alive and remain shall up together, meet them in clouds in the air. So shall we ever be with the Lord. That's what it's all about. He wants you with him forever. And when the thief was on the cross... You know, there were two there. One of them, amazing as it is, recognized Jesus as to who he was. Hard to believe. And he said, remember me. Jesus says, I will. You will be, there it is again, with me in paradise. That's what it's all about, folks. And that's why God will open our eyes to areas we need to grow in. And it's especially important for us today. We're living close to the second coming of Jesus. And God's going to have a people ready for that great day. And that's why he wants us to understand these things. Because it says in 1 John 3, verse 2, he says, Right now we're the sons of God. It does not yet appear what we shall be, but we know when he comes, we shall be like That's what he's trying to do. Make us like Jesus. And the beauty of it, he will do it if we ask him. Fill us with your spirit, Lord. Jesus, live out your life in me. Whenever I am tempted, I simply say, Jesus, give me your whatever I need. Patience, forgiveness. And I'll just close with this. This little illustration makes it very real to me. It's like I'm a uh, quadriplegic and I'm sitting in this chair. And God says, dig that hole. No, (laughs) I can't stand up. I can't use my arms. I can't do anything. And he's asked me to dig that hole. And what do I say? I got a first degree. Yes, I think the hole should be dug. Lord, you do it. That's how it is, folks. God says, forgive that person that hurt you. You're a quadriplegic. You can't do it. But you've got to agree. Yes, Lord, I do want to forgive that person. Okay, Lord, you do it. <laughs> you forgive that person through me. It's that simple. 
It's not complicated. So I'll say it again. Everything God asks you to do, he will do it in you and through you. He's a all-sufficient Savior. And folks, the day's coming when we're all going to be together in heaven and rejoicing, and I've chosen that for our closing song when we all get to heaven. And if there's any here today that you've had a conviction, maybe you've never given your life to Jesus, or you once did and you know in your heart you drifted away, I want to make this available each Sabbath. We're going to have a couple of elders up front. On my right, your left. And if you'd like to come up for prayer, for a commitment to Christ or a recommitment to Jesus, after the service is done, feel free to come on up. We have a couple of elders up here. So for right now, we'll sing our closing song, number 633, when we all get to heaven. Shall we stand? Sing the wondrous love of Jesus, sing His mercy and His grace in the mansion bright and blessed. He'll prepare for us a place. Oh, get to heaven! What a day of rejoicing that will be! streets of gold when we all get to heaven what a day of rejoicing shall we be when we all see Jesus we'll sing and shout the victory Father, we so look forward to that glorious day. I thank you, Father, for calling each of us to spend eternity with you. Every one of us in this sanctuary this morning have heard that call or we wouldn't be here. But you know where we're each at in our walk with you. I ask, Lord, that by the power of your Spirit, you will continue to fill us each with your presence. Let not the enemy ever discourage us. Wherever we see that we have failed, may we immediately turn to you for forgiveness. 
and believe that you forgive. And if there's anyone here today that has some sin in their life and they really have doubted that God could ever forgive that, I pray by your spirit right now, Lord, you will convict them that yes, there is no sin too sinful that you cannot forgive. I ask, Lord, that you will continue to guide us in our walk with you. That means you will show us things in our life that need to be changed. But may we remember, whatever you ask us to do, you will do it in us if we ask you to and believe that Jesus will change us according to your will. So continue to guide us, each one, on our journey. I know our Lord is coming soon, and we long for that day. What a glorious day it will be. In Jesus' name, amen. Hi, I'm Dennis Smith, pastor of the Clearview Seventh Avenue Church. We're located at 19554 North Popico Drive in Surprise, Arizona. The major focus in our church is, of course, on Jesus Christ, and also on prayer and the Holy Spirit. I find it interesting that when Christ gave us what's called the Lord's Prayer, as part of that prayer, we were to ask the Father that His will be done in earth as it is in heaven. And that's fascinated me for years. And it had a major impact in my life and as a pastor to realize that when God wants something done in this world, it's absolutely essential that we as Christians ask Him to do it. And that gives Him the rite of passage. So in our church here in Surprise, we have as our mission statement to be spirit-filled, spirit-empowered, and spirit-led. I'd like to invite you to visit us when you're in our area. Our Sabbath school service begins at 9.20 on Saturday morning, and our worship service begins at 11 o'clock on Saturday morning. Hope to see you then.